Okay, here we are in um, Southampton, south of London. Myself and my dear friend, Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer, doing Philippians. What is Philippians 2, isn't it? Um, yes, Philippians 2, 1 to 13. Yeah, give it to us. Can I read it to you? Please. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Beautiful. It's a well known passage, isn't it? But um, we often think of the ketosis passage, isn't it? Because uh, Jesus emptied himself, and there's been all sorts of theological speculation on how to take that. Um, often, I think we get so focused on that we miss the bigger picture which is it's a partial appeal isn't it for unity of heart and spirit um, yeah putting it in that context of working out your salvation fear and trembling in that context okay so what are your thoughts it's a favorite for you yeah it's a powerful passage um a very powerful passage because paul is using the example of christ to challenge his followers to emulate him in not being proud, not being arrogant, and thinking of the needs of others rather than themselves. It, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the example of the life of Jesus is almost never used no. by, by, in the Gospels or the Epistles, is it? The exception being uh, 1 Peter, where Peter says Jesus' example of not hitting back. Yes. He did this to, to, that you might follow in his footsteps. He says, yes. isn't he? You know, this is an example of non retaliation. But here it's. Um, well, more generally speaking, have the mind of Christ. And it's about foregoing power, isn't it? Yes. And we assume that we're dealing, well, most people assume we're dealing with early hymnal sort of fragment here, aren't we? That the, uh, the, the ketosis bit about he emptied himself that was part of early Christian hymn. I don't know if that's because it's in you know, rhyming verse in the Greek. I don't think it is. But it, most people assume it's some sort of early liturgical fragment, don't it they? It could be. Yes, it could be. Um, I mean, I, I like it liken it to um, a mandate just as God the Father sent the Son to save the world he's called us to share in practical words and deeds that salvation with others and we do that by caring about their needs so, you know someone said people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care typically uh, when I think of preachers they are they focus on words and trying to argue and convince you by their rhetoric or by their logic that they're right and you're wrong but I think it's a much more powerful witness 
when people feel self-conscious because of our actions, i.e. they're influenced much more by our actions. You think of when Jesus stilled a storm, Peter's reaction was, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. But, you know, the, the act of saving them from drowning caused Peter to reflect upon his unworthiness and his need of God's forgiveness. Yeah. It's interesting in terms of tying that in with the cross, because you know, if this is indeed a really liturgical fragment, it perhaps reflects one of the earliest pieces we have of, of people of faith reflecting on the work of the cross. And in this case, not seeing it so much in terms of the theology of atonement or anything they used to, but simply as an act of humility and obedience. Yes, and the fact that it may have been a liturgical um, liturgy, if you like, suggests or implies that it was used regularly on Sundays but also during the week as people reflected daily on their their walk so that it would have been in their mind regularly that this is how we are to behave as Christians yeah you know Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, again, we, we tend to focus on working out our salvation, i.e. it's works. But actually the text says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose. So we work out what God is working in. And in this context, it seems to be working it out in the context of disputes within the community. Yes. Um, because that's the overall thing, is to have this one mind amongst you. I can't imagine they say you've got to agree on everything, but there's a point in terms of having a, having a general, a single focus, isn't there, or something. It is, and it's looking at people and thinking, Lord, what, what do you want me to say or do that will encourage, that will help them find you and a closer walk with you so it's it's being more observant so you know when you see the guy in the street who's in need is it a distraction because I'm late or is it an opportunity Lord I'm going to be late but I have a responsibility here thank you I think the remarkable thing about this pulling it back into the context is this is definitely Paul's archetypal prison epistle yes isn't it so he's writing in prison perhaps shackled with his yeah. legs I mean he's probably got other people in there with him you know well his, 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 his captive audience were the, were the soldiers who well, yes, had no so choice but to change him every soldier. four hours yeah. he got to preach the same sermon half a dozen times well, a day that's a good model for a church yeah well I think the, we often think of Paul as sort of sitting up at night writing you know and he's tapping on his computer or something by himself yeah. he's generally in the company of other people in this prison situation he'd have other prisoners with yes. him he may also have some of his friends with him Barnabas may be yep. there you know whoever's writing the thing down for him he may not he's probably not writing it himself yeah. um, and I think that's often you know we get these things where people say well this can't be from Paul because the language is different well it maybe he had other people in the cell who were course he did. Yes, you know? he did. Um, but yes. he says follow me as I follow Christ so his example is what mattered not what he said well I, I see it a bit like a musical because here they are all sitting together in the prison cell, they're riding away, people are chipping bits in, and all of a sudden he breaks into, have this mind among you, which is in Christ Jesus, everybody gets up and starts Quick, to let's sing. write this down. <laughs> well, they all sing the old familiar hymn together, yeah. at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, yeah. and uh, then they sit down again and, <laughs> and continue. You know, but it's, it's uh, I don't think that's even too fanciful, is it? Because we hear of Paul singing in prison, and I, I can imagine him and his his friends all of a sudden sort of breaking out in this piece of liturgy that they're all familiar with and all saying and singing it together. Yeah. You know, and then getting back to the bit of writing. I mean, what that reflects me, the extraordinary piety of the man who's evidently in a life and death situation and would be in a state of deprivation and pain. And it shows how his his burden was for them not for exactly. himself well he, he says, has he has in him the mind that was in Christ yeah. Jesus he says make my joy complete yes make me joyful by hearing that you're united together that you're working together rather than fighting each other yeah well he exemplifies the very mindset of Christ that he um, refers to not thinking of himself but emptying himself and Jesus in his prayer before Good Friday he prays that his 
disciples will be one as we are one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just in closing, how, how do we interpret that? Because, I mean, I'm thinking, Joy and I have been talking a lot about the the voice to parliament vote coming up in Australia. You know, we're not one on that. And surely we don't need to be one on opinions about everything, no matter how important they are. So what, where does oneness... It has to be love, it? doesn't it? The oneness, it has to be love. Okay. Yeah, so even in the, in the political differences, we're driven by the same one love. Exactly. It has to be on the basis of, of our understanding of what God has done in our life and what our responsibility is. So it certainly, for me, means treating people the same equally. You know, at the moment, our government is debating whether um, people who claim to be gay have the right to asylum. So it's saying these people, oh, because you, of their yes, orientation, from, uh, from can Iran, be treated differently. Like asylum seekers. Yeah, we welcome, uh, we, we welcome many, many people from Ukraine, but we make it very hard for people from other countries to gain asylum. Yeah. And, that's, and I said to someone this week, well, we need to say it's racism. It's not, it's not just different policies, it's racism and it's wrong. We should treat everyone the same. It's hard to mention that. As a, we as shouldn't all have one mind on that. Sorry? It's hard to mention we shouldn't all be of one mind on that. I mean, I appreciate on some of the border issues such as Ukraine, we can be driven by the same sense of love and have different opinions. So is that how that should well, work? Well, for me, that. that's the whole point of the... We call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. The word good doesn't appear in the story, um, but we assume that the guy, um, the victim, was Jewish. Jesus doesn't tell us that. He says he's naked and half dead, I meaning he's unconscious and, and naked. That made him what? It made him, well, nobody could tell. Unrecognizable. It made him an unknown person. And the question is, are you going to stop for that person? It, you know, if he was dressed as a Jew, then a Jew would stop. If he was dressed as a Samaritan, the Samaritan would stop. But he takes that away, strips it away, and says, "This is a human being. Will you stop for a human being?" Um, that's my my bottom line. Am I treating people as human beings, not as middle class, upper class, white, black, indigenous, whatever? <coughs> Am I treating them as human beings? So love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor as yourself. One love. Many interpretations. <laughs> <laughs> One application. Yeah. Love. Yeah. All right. We've got to keep working at it. In fear and trembling. <laughs> and that's why Paul wrote this passage, because they were not. He says, if you have any encouragement, any comfort, make my joy complete, like-minded, same love, one in spirit, one mind. They clearly weren't, but that was what he was calling them to. They were genuinely following Jesus. Yeah, still a work in progress, isn't it? We are. We're a work in progress. God has not finished with us yet. Think about it. When we become followers of Christ, he could rapture us to heaven there and then. But we have work to do, preparing for eternity. Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs>